Hello there. In this video we're going to discuss uh, another type of function that we have yet to discuss. So far we've talked about exponentials, polynomials, sines and cosines. You could easily talk about hyperbolic trig functions as well, um, since you already know the exponential properties. But we're going to look at a very basic one. Uh, in particular we're going to be looking at the extensions of the derivative of a constant and also the integral of a constant as well. So we know that the derivative of a constant is zero, and the integral of a constant is a constant uh, linear function, right? So we're going to be looking at the grunewald lenikov derivative of a constant, and also the riemann liouville uh, integral of a constant as well. Alright, so we're going to start with the riemann liouville uh, integral of a constant first, and we're going to try and keep the base points as general as possible because, you know, keeping them as general as possible is definitely a lot more powerful than choosing a particular base point that gives us what we want, right? Alright, so the first thing we're going to look at is the riemann liouville integral with base point A of x of order alpha of some constant c. Alright, so using the definition, this is just going to be equal to 1 divided by gamma alpha times the integral from a to x of x minus t to the power alpha minus 1 times our function evaluated at t dt. Um, very simple, we can factor this out since it's just a constant. So this is just going to be equal to c multiplied by 1 over gamma alpha times the integral from a to x of x minus t alpha minus 1 dt. Alright, so this is pretty much just a shift to power rule, so uh, quick u substitution can easily take care of this for us. Um, so this is of course going to be equal to um, c times 1 over gamma alpha um, times the integral from 0 to x minus a of u to the alpha minus 1 du. Alright, so then we can apply our power rule to this expression, right? This is just the normal integral of a power, so we can easily figure that out. So it's going to be c times 1 over gamma alpha times u to the alpha divided by our new exponent. And then we need to evaluate this at x minus a and at 0. So clearly we have an issue here. We cannot have alpha is equal to 0. Right. Now we know that the 0th integral and the 0th derivative is just the function itself, right? So we know that this should be equal to c. But this definition does not imply that, right? That's a little bit uncomfortable, but let's sort of look over that for at least the time being. You can probably easily see um, how this uh, can go away um, somewhat, uh, because this is going to be equal to, let's write this in a different way, uh, c divided by alpha gamma alpha um, times u to the alpha. Let's just evaluate that. Oh, that's not that big of a deal. That's just going to be x minus a to the power of alpha. All right, so this is our relationship. So this is... Uh, R, L, I, A, X, alpha, C, right? Um, so what I mean by this property can still be extended, remember that gamma alpha, remember the graph of the gamma function, um, has this type of property. So as alpha gets close to zero from the right-hand side, which is pretty much what we're doing, it goes to positive infinity. So we have this positive infinite quantity here, we have this zero quantity here. And using some fake math, you can, you know, treat, say, 0 as 1 over infinity, the infinities cancel, and they pretty much disappear, right? Um, and since they disappear, alpha is 0, that goes to 1, and then we're just left with c. Uh, I'm not going to prove that limit here, but you can go through the limit proof of that to get a more rigorous um, understanding uh, of that expression. Right, so what else do we have here? So if we choose a particular base point, I mean, this is pretty general, but typically we de like dealing with base points of zero, right? But as a corollary, we have that this is going to be equal to c divided by alpha, gamma alpha, uh, times x to the power of alpha, right? Now, this is useful. So a couple examples to sort of illustrate this. So example one. Suppose I ask you to find the riemann liouville fractional integral with base point 0 of x of order 1 of c. 
So that's just going to be equal to c over 1 gamma 1 or times x to the power of 1, which is of course equal to cx. So that property matches our uh, classical calculus property. So what about the riemann lubo base point 0 x of 2 of c? So this is going to be equal to c over 2 gamma 2 uh, times x to the power of 2, which is just going to be equal to c half x squared. So that also matches the classical calculus um, result. So riemann lubo seems to treat constants relatively well and fairly, and everything seems to match up perfectly. So what about the grunewald lenikov derivative? Now this is where things um, become interesting. So we're going to be looking at the grunewald lenikov derivative, base point A, let's keep it general, x of alpha of some constant c. So let's just jump to the definition. Um, so remember at the very end of GL, there's a f evaluated at some point. That's just going to be c, so I'm just going to factor that out from the start. So I'm going to have c times um, the limit of my term. So n divided by x minus a to the power of alpha times the sum. L is equal to 0 to n minus 1 to the L. Gamma alpha plus 1, all factorial, gamma alpha plus 1 minus L. All right, so that's my GL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose my base point A. I'm going to choose A to be equal to 0, because that's typically what we're comfortable working with, at least with polynomials. So therefore, we have uh, GL0 alpha x of C is going to be equal to C times the limit as n goes to infinity of n divided by x to the power of alpha times the sum this expression. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull out everything that is not dependent on n. So I'm going to factor out this x to the alpha term out front. So then we have d0 GLA x of c is going to be equal to c times uh, x to the minus alpha times the rest of this. All right, so this term uh, is the only thing that we really need to work on. So one can go through a rigorous proof um, using the properties of gamma, beta, and alternating series, and all those things, and also some other special relationships in order to verify that this term here is actually the same as 1 divided by gamma 1 minus alpha. right? So that's a very interesting result, in case you aren't already aware of it. So therefore, we have alpha of c is equal to c over x to the alpha gamma 1 minus alpha. And this is our interesting result. So as an immediate corollary, we have the half derivative of, say, 5 is not equal to 0, obviously, right? So the fractional derivatives, assuming alpha is in between 0 and 1, is not equal to 0, right? Now, why do we care about this? So let us assume we're going back to the fractional differential equations discussion, right? And let's assume we have something like, um, uh, let's assume we have, say, the fractional derivative of u is equal to, um, I don't know, zero, right? So let's solve this fractional differential equation, right? So if I want to integrate both sides, Maybe I say, okay, therefore u is equal to a constant, right? No, this is not true, right? Because the half derivative of a constant is non-zero. Therefore, a constant function is not the solution of this fractional differential equation. And that is extremely important, right? So you can't just tack on a plus c at the end of all of these equations um, when you're working with fractional differential equations. So that is extremely important. So um, let us look at a particular half derivative of a constant. So if I do the GL base point 0 of x of 1 half of c, 
So this is just going to be equal to c times x to the 1 half divided by gamma of minus 1 half, right? And this is going to be minus 1 half. So this is the same thing as, so we know what gamma of 1 half is. That's just going to be the square root of pi. So this is just going to be equal to c divided by the square root of pi x. So you should know, um, and you can look at the absolute value if you want to look at the left and the right hand side if you want to. Um, and we're going to have something that looks like this. Right? So this is the half derivative of some constant, 5, 1, pi, e, whatever you want. Um, primarily looking at the right hand side since we're choosing values that are larger than zero. So we have a couple issues here. Um, fractional derivatives of constants uh, give us a vertical asymptote uh, at x is equal to zero. And I'll leave for you to answer, is that related to this point? Like if I choose a base point of one, uh, am I gonna have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to one? That answer should be obvious, but I'm not gonna answer it here. All right, so let us look at a little bit detail um, what's going on here. So clearly the half derivative of the third derivative of the fourth derivative of constants are non-zero. So as we approach the first derivative of a constant, this should be equal to zero, right? All right, so this is a theorem that you should be able to prove on your own. Uh, in particular, the limit, as alpha approaches one from the right, of c divided by x alpha gamma one minus alpha. So this should be equal to what? Guess, zero. At least we would like it to, right? So why do I say that this should be obvious? So we can take a look at this piece right quick. So we have c over x alpha, and then we have one over gamma one minus alpha, right? So as alpha approaches one from the right-hand side, we know that this gets close to infinity, this term. So one, div one divided by infinity gets close to zero, right? This term right here gets close to what? So that's gonna get close to c divided by x. So c divided by x provided x is not equal to zero is gonna be a positive number if we're approaching x from the right-hand side, and c is a positive number, but that shouldn't matter because one divided by an extremely large number is an extremely small number, so it should get close to zero. I invite you to go through the details of a rigorous proof for that if you want, um, but one should see that this definitely is the case. So we can look at, say, a phase um, diagram for each of the derivatives. So for example, we have alpha is equal to zero and alpha is equal to one. We're talking about the GL derivative of some constant. So we have our constant here, so this is y is equal to c. We have a result here, y is equal to zero. And we have some transitional phases. So we have, say, alpha is equal to one-third, and alpha is equal to two-thirds. Or you can partition the interval zero to one in whatever way you want. So one can find that one-third, the third derivative of a constant, also has this shape. And the two-thirds derivative also has the same kind of shape, right? Now I want to emphasize the difference between these two things. Remember back when we talked about the transformational interpretation of fractional derivatives and sort of what that looked like. So if I'm looking at a particular uh, shape, uh, and we're only going to focus on the top half, so I'm not even going to draw the bottom axis. So if this is a derivative, if I want to converge to zero, I need to pull uh, these points down a little bit more sharply, right? So as I approach alpha is equal to one, these lines definitely should approach um, the origin, right? These sort of curvature points uh, on the end here, right, should be getting closer and closer to the origin if alpha gets close to one. So, as alpha approaches 1, what we're almost doing here is approaching this curve here. Right? So, all these points up here is pretty much going at infinity, right? So, it's almost like a, a unit impulse function in a way, right? Now, remember, um, once alpha is equal to 0, or once alpha is equal to 1, the fractional derivative uh, is not continuous because the origin is the uh, base point, and it's not continuous there. Very easy to prove that. But anyway, I hope this gives you some idea 
of uh, fractional derivatives uh, and fractional integrals of constants. Uh, for RL, it doesn't really seem to give us that much of a problem, um, but it's very important that the fractional derivative between 0 and 1 of a constant is not equal to 0. And this is extremely important once we start our discussion of fractional differential equations. Hope you enjoyed.